take a look and start our beginning of word problems. You're going to notice in this class, especially, that there are a lot of word problems in math. You're going to see it also in geometry and in pre-calc. And then when you get to AP Calculus, everything is word problems there. Okay, so you have to understand how you apply things to everyday life. So today's goals are just to translate words into logical statements, and then word sentences into equations. Okay, so statements and equations. So we'll start with statements. So let's represent each word phrase below by an algebraic expression. And we'll use H for a variable here. So part A, a given number, some number we don't know, decreased by 4. What does that look like algebraically, Paul? H minus 4. Okay, a number, H, some random variable, minus 4. Okay, part A, very easy. Part B, part B, 8 more than 5 times a number. 8 more, Nile, than 5 times a number. How much 5H plus 8? Good. Now, I want to point something out. In part B, Nile could have said this backwards, right? Because the commutative law of addition, technically, he could have said 8 plus 5H. But he didn't, which is fine. They're not allowed you to do this because you read it the way it was. But part A, you can't do that, right? Part A, 4 minus H and H minus 4 are different things. So the order of the words does matter. Now, in cases where it's addition, you can move them around. But keep in, in, your, in the back of your mind the order in which the words appear in the statement. How about part C? The difference between a number and its square. The difference between a number and its square. This one's a little bit trickier. This means close. Close. Sabine said h squared minus h. Yeah, h minus h squared. That's what I mean by this. So the difference between 10 and 7, you would do 10 minus 7. Okay, now obviously it's a little bit more difficult when it's variables because the numbers aren't there. But between a number and its square means you take the number and subtract from it its square. Okay, subtract from it its square. How about part D? How about part D? The sum of twice a number and half that number's absolute value. Right. 2H plus H in the absolute value of the line here. Oh. <clears throat> 2H plus H. Very good. Well done, Ryan. Okay. The sum of means the plus sign in the middle. So here's the beginning of the sentence. The sum of twice a number comes right here, and half that number's absolute value is right here. Okay? Now, how else could I have written this? Instead of absolute value of h over 2, what else could you do, Nina? Absolute value. Yeah, you could always put a 1 half as a coefficient and multiply it by the absolute value of h. So if you had done this instead, instead of dividing by 2, it's also correct. Half of a number, same as dividing by 2, based on our definition of division. And finally, part e. Part e. Ah. Um, 2 and then in parentheses over, over h plus 9. Good. And how would I say that mathematically? I know you said in parentheses, but there's a way to say it. When you see parentheses, what do you say in math? Anybody know? You want to take a stab? Yeah, what do you say? Open parentheses, close parentheses. You could say that, but just to avoid saying parentheses a lot, there's an easier term you use, usually use. The quantity of. Yeah, the quantity of. Very good. Man. The quantity of. So 2 times the quantity of h plus 9. Okay? Or 2 times the quantity h plus 9. And you emphasize it with your pauses and your statements. So you should be able to do math, right, obviously. But you also may be able to speak it. So if you're one day, say you're an engineer one day, you're giving a presentation, you have to discuss things. You need to have that, the, right, um, the right terms or use the right words as you're presenting. What's the word? Loquacious, right? Someone that can pr say things correctly? I don't know. I think that's right. So double a number, the sum of a number, and nine. Put it right there. Take a look at this. Good. Did you say hello? Huh? <laughs> All right. Example two. You do have enough, you know. You don't know how, you don't know how long not numerical, not numerical. Remember, we're doing, we're turning 
What did we do in the last problem? We turned everything into variables, right? So we're going to answer in terms of variables right now. Absolutely. So we're going to, you have a variable for that. Pick a variable for that. T. So you do have enough information to write an expression. That's what we're doing, Luke, right? So Luke is right. You can't come up with a number. There's no, there's no way you can get an actual numerical answer. But in this section in 1.8, what we're trying to do is we're, ta we're taking word problems and just writing symbolic uh, expressions for them. So let's start with calling some variable T time because we don't know how much time he's driven for. Okay? Let's say hypothetically, though. Hypothetically, again, 200 miles apart. And I'm going at, as you can see, 50 miles every hour. After two hours, how far would I travel? How far would I travel after two hours, Kelly? 100 miles. 100 miles. So there's 50 miles, maybe, and there's 50 miles after two hours, so I'm now halfway there. Agreed? If I were to travel for three hours, I would get up to 50, 100, 150, leaving how much space between me and the city? 50. 50 miles, because you take the 200 and you subtract the 150 you cover. Agreed? So the whole idea is that you take the 200 and subtract the distance covered. So let's think about this. So our general statement is going to be 200 minus whatever distance covered it is. But we don't know the distance covered because we don't know the time. That's what Luca was mentioning. So we do know that distance equals what? What's the formula for distance always? For constant speed. Rate times time. Rate times time. Okay, D equals RT. D equals RT. Any rate times the time will always give you a distance, assuming the units are right. We know the rate. What's the rate in this problem? What's the rate in this problem? Well, 50 miles an hour. So I think, I think about it this way. I put a 50 there, but I don't know how many hours I've traveled for, so we call that a variable T. And just put the T there. So that's the expression that would represent how far away James is from the city at any given point in time. Now, what limitations do I have to make about this statement? Let's see who knows this. What constraints or restrictions do I need to make? Right. Well, I mean, you can't pull. No, no, say it. You can't what? I want to hear what you're going to say, though. Well, I was going to say you can't have, like, 30 minutes and hours. Right now, we're looking at integers, okay? So we can think about that. What else, but holistically, if we look at the problem? Sure, I'm, this is good, you guys are doing real life stuff. You're probably not going to go travel 50 miles an hour. That's true also. Well, if it was true, it couldn't be more than four hours. That's what I was thinking. Can't be more than four hours in this problem, right? T can't be greater than four, or else what would, what, what would James do? He'll go, go past the city, and the goal is to get to the city. So we could say a problem like this, we have a restricted domain. T must be less than or equal to four. Just something to think about, right? Okay, in a problem like this, because obviously if James travels more than four hours, he goes more than 200 miles, and thus he surpasses the city's location. He would go beyond the city. Make sense? I like what you guys added, though. That's fine, so don't worry. I wanted to hear the real life things, and that's true. What you said was right. All right, let's go to example three. So in this problem, we want to find the measure of the third angle of a triangle in its simplest form, if one angle is measured as k, and the measure of the second angle is 15 less than half the measure of that first angle. Okay, and obviously it's not going to be a number answer again, it's going to be in terms of k. It's going to be in terms of k. What do we know about the triangle and its angles? Just give me that statement first. All the triangle and together equal 180. Good. The sum of the angles equals 180. We know that already, right? So angle 1 plus angle 2 plus angle 3 equals 180 degrees. Absolutely, absolutely right. Next, what's angle one? Doesn't matter which is which spot, but what's one of the angles? Give me a variable representation, Kelly. K. K. What's angle two then? K over two minus 15. What is it? K over two minus 15. K over two minus 15, because we're looking at the measure of the second angle is 15 less than, so it's going to be something with a minus 15 right there. Oh, it's not showing up. There it goes. Okay, the second angle is going to be in these parentheses. 15 less than means put a minus 15. Half the first one means 1 half K. Does that make sense how we're writing that? So when I see 15 less than something, I start by putting a minus 15. And since it's less than something else, I put the 1 half K, which is half the first angle in front of it. 
And what am I, what's my goal to find? What are we trying to find in this problem? The third angle. So call that another variable. A. And that equals 180. So see how yesterday we solved for variables in terms of other variables? We're doing that again here. Okay, so we combine like terms and move things over. So let's take a look. K plus a half a K is 1.5 K. Minus 15 still. Plus A equals 180. Then I want to get A by itself. What should I do next? What should I do next to get A by itself? Nina? Add, 15 add the 15, absolutely. Okay, add the 15 to both sides, giving us 195. Again, remember, okay, we want to combine like terms always first. And finally, the last step to get A by itself, to isolate the variable A, how do we get rid of a 1.5K? What do we think of this as? What's the term I've been saying? We think of this as if it's a constant. constant. And if this were a number, I would just subtract it, wouldn't I? So just take this whole quantity and subtract it over. A equals 195 minus 1.5K. So the third angle's representation is written in terms of the first two angles. Or really in terms of the first angle, actually, because it's good. Take a look at number four. Go through the problem and write down what you have. I'll come over and look to make sure you're right. Here's the one. You can have a long expression, but simplify it, please. Everything's in terms of that, so simplify it. If you're struggling, think about what this would mean with numerical values in your head and how those work. Hey, feel free to talk to the person next to you if you're struggling. It's fine, guys. I said that before. I don't mind. If you're having some troubles, you want to check or ask the person around you how to, how to work it through. So here's how I think about it. I think, for example, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, that's five consecutive even integers. Agreed? If the fourth one is m, what is this in terms of m? m plus, everybody? Two. two. What is this one? m. m two. This is m minus? Four. This is m minus? Six. So you write all those out, right? And we want the sum of those. So m minus six plus m minus four plus m minus two plus our fourth integer, which is m, plus m plus two. There's definitely five M's there. We can see that. The negative two and the positive two you can cancel. And then I get a negative six and a negative four giving me a negative ten. Giving you an expression 5M minus ten. Okay, again, this weekend train and it leaves town and it's traveling at 50 kilometers an hour east. Okay, three hours later another train leaves town traveling 
at 75 kilometer hours, 75 kilometers per hour east on the same track. Is there a typo on yours? Does it say track or does it say train? Track. It says track? Okay, I cracked it. Good. It said train there. And I just made sure to correct. How long will it take the second train to catch up to the first? How long will it take it to catch up to the first? So this is a kind of physics problem that you're going to see. Okay, where you have to think about two rates of change and how they relate to one another. So how can I start a problem like this? How can I start a problem? Luca, give me a starting point. Say it one more time. 50A equals 75A minus 3. But that's not a starting point. So I didn't ask for the answer. So just make sure you're answering the question. Okay, you're jumping a little bit ahead, which is fine. You're going right to it, Luca. But I want to see where, where that comes up. It's like, how would you explain that? How would you explain that to the class? Because there's a three hour gap in time there? So what does A represent? That's what, that's what I'm saying. Like, what, are the, what does this mean? What's A? So let's start with our starting point then, right? Do you see how confusing it gets right away when you just write equations? Because if you do that on a test, I'm telling you now, you're going to start doing the work, forgetting what is what, and then come up with at the end, I don't know what I actually did. So let's start with a given or what we know. What do we know? What do we know? What does the problem tell us? All right, so rate one is 50 kilometers per hour. Okay, this will help us. And I'm telling you, the method I'm showing you right now, especially when you start problems, just understand what's going on. Okay? Mike, what else? Okay, so how do I write that, Mike? That's the question. How do I think about that? You're right. The second train left three hours after the first one. But how do I represent that algebraically? What do I do? What kind of a statement can I make? Because now we're taking words and we're, we're turning them into equations. We're taking English and turning it into math. Yeah. Um, you could do um, 75 kilometers per hour minus 3 times 50. But those units don't make sense. I can't do 75 kilometers per hour minus a rate times a time. So I can't do that. You're, you, you could, you're kind of on the idea of what you can do. Did you say the first train was 150 kilometers ahead of that? Okay, you could find the gap, how far in front of it it is. That's one way to do it. Because this first train got started three hours ahead of time, right? And it was traveling at 50 kilometers an hour. So you know what the gap will be that it has to cover. That's one way. How could I write a statement, though, that you... Your statement, Mike, was what we wanted to start with. The train leaves three hours earlier than the other. So how do I write that algebraically? Remember, we need to turn words into symbols. How do I write that algebraically? Yeah, Sabine. Okay, why? Okay. Again, the whole equation helping us. How can I write a simple statement with just time, though? Just time. I'm trying to take you one step at a time. Pun intended, I guess. One step at a time. What's the statement that relates the two? If I were to call the first time T1, how would I relate that to T2? How is that related to T2? What does it say in the problem? It says... Three hours later, that train leaves, right? So if I'm train one and I leave the station, and I'm going and I'm going, and then Ryan, or yeah, Ryan is, not Ryan, uh, N Niall is train two. And Niall leaves three hours after me. It means that the time I've been running for is three hours more than Niall's time. Agreed? Because I left three hours first. So it's three hours more than his. So it makes sense if you take this and write the statement that the time the first train is operating for is always going to be three hours more than the second train. We're writing up a comparison, or we're showing the comparison of those two trains, how they're, how they're moving. What's rate two? What's rate two? That's it. 75 kilometers per hour. That's rate two. 
Okay? Now, let's draw a little diagram here. Let's say here's train one, and it left the station. Okay, and it's here. Here's train two, it waited, and now it's behind it. Okay, so right now, it's a certain distance behind still. So here's train one at a point in time, here's train two, and it's trying to catch up, and it can't get there. It's working real hard to catch up, and it's not making it. So it's, what is it doing? It's closing this gap over time, right? It's closing that gap. When the gap is completely closed, when train two catches up to train one, how far will they have traveled relative to one another? <coughs> Bless you, man. How far will they have traveled relative to one another? Once the second train catches up to the first one. Let's demo it. Two people come up. Who wants to come up? Nah? Come on up. Paul, come up. Awesome. All right, so what I want you to do is this. Now, I want you to start first and walk at a slow pace. Right. Paul, I want you to wait about three or four seconds, but walk at a quicker pace. And when I say pause, I want you to pause no matter where you are. Okay? So start first now. Okay. Start, Paul. Okay, pause. So right now, Paul's catching up. He was originally a little bit further back, but he's going to continue. So catch up to him before we get to the podium. Okay, pause. When they catch up, how far have they both traveled with regards to one another? We don't know the length, but how far with respect to one another? Equal. The same or equal, right? The same. For a train to catch up to another train, the distances they travel have got to be the same distance, right? Thanks, guys. So what can we say as a result? We've listed our time relationship. We've listed what we know about rates. What can I say about distances now? So algebraically, well, what do I say? What variable represents distance? What? What are you going to use for distance? So what could you say? Well, what if I said D1 equals, what would you fill in the blank with? Yeah, D2. Guys, you're making it harder than it is on yourselves. Okay? You, the thing is, you're not given numbers for this kind of stuff, right? You have no idea about the distance traveled right now. You don't even need the distance traveled to do this. Okay? We don't even need it at all. We're trying to figure out how long it will take. So there's no reason we have to solve for distance in these problems. So the fact that we know they're equal to each other is all we need here. So if we were to, remember in the beginning, what was your suggestion? It was like one train is 150 miles ahead of the other one or kilometers ahead. And that works. And we can go about that method. But the reason we're using this method right now is watch. We don't actually need anything to do with distance. What's our formula for distance? What's our formula for distance? Distance equals? Rate times time. So for each of these, instead of D1 and D2, I could say R1, T1 equals R2, T2. Again, the distance equals rate times time. But distance for the first object is the rate of the first object times the time of the first object. The distance traveled for the second object is its rate times its time. So now I've got an equation. But the problem is right now, how many variables do I have in this bottom line here? How many different variables? Be careful. Four. So I cannot solve, right? So I need to plug in some givens. And it looks like up top, here's all my givens, right? Well, before I plug in, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? What's the goal of this whole problem? The time it takes the second train to catch up to the first. Very good. So that's T2, isn't it? So are we trying to find T2? So if I plug in for R1 with what I know, I plug in for R2 with what I also know, and then I look up here and I see this relationship. Well, if you take, this is T1, right? Remember substitution principle? I could take this entire thing, plug it in right there for T1, because that's the algebraic representation. If I plug in for T1 there, for R1 and R2, now the only variable left is T2. And we've solved the problem. We don't need anything with distances. We don't have to cover distances in the problem. But we're able to do this by looking at just distance rate formulas. So plug in, you get 50 times the quantity 3 plus T2 equals 75 times T2. Clearly, we're going to have to distribute, right? We have to distribute the 50 to both of those. 
Combine like terms and solve for T2. Go through that last step on your own, please. Okay, finish solving that at least so you can work on your algebra. Make sure to combine like terms, please. And I'm showing these red <laughs> steps. I'm not going to show these throughout the year, so your algebra needs to be on point. Again, the red step there, I'm not usually going to show. I am today, just so we're all clear. Yeah? That's fine. But did you end up getting the distance in the end or no? So sh come up, show me, show me your thing so I can see what you did. So we divide by 25, we get T2 equals 6 hours. So, let's see, 50 hours, what does that say? 3 minus 3 times 75. You saw for the first time for the train. Is that right? That's what you got for the first time? Yeah. For the, for the second train, we're looking for six hours. So you just subtract three. You get the same answer. Yeah, that's fine. But Luke, I really want you to write down your, like, if you just wrote that equation out, wh where did those numbers come up with? You had trouble even explaining it. Now, it's good that you can see that. That's really good. But just list, like, if A2, was that your time? So you should start by saying, let A equal the time, and now I'm going to use distance rate so you understand the process. This is a simple problem. You might be able to just look at it quickly, you know? But when you get to more complex things, especially in physics, where you have three parts to one problem, and there's like an object moving, right? Then it stops, then it moves at a different speed, then it starts to accelerate. You have to actually go through each part of the problem, and it's not going to be a simple linear equation. So what we're trying to develop is just problem-solving skills where you label everything and you understand everything. I'm glad that you got the same, but try and understand the way that we're going through it. Okay? But it's fine that you did it that way. Other question or saw a hand? How do you get to six hours? How do you get to six hours? Divide by twenty-five? Oh. Okay. One fifty over twenty-five is six? Oh, okay. And that's what T2 we're looking for? So Luca got nine with his, but what was he solving for? Oh that number of hours in total in the first train. Yeah, the first train left three hours earlier, remember? That's why he got 9 as his answer when he was solving his equation. So it depends on what we're looking for in the problem. So let's make sure we identify T1, T2 that we're specific to look what we're solving for. But even if we had solved for T1, that's fine. If we had gotten 9, we would just take away 3 to see what T2 was then, right? And we could have solved for T1 had we wanted to by rearranging the formula at the top. Okay? It's really good that we're seeing different approaches and that they both work. And the approach that Charles had mentioned by looking at the gap that was uh, existing in the beginning would, I think, also work, but it might be tough because of the distance traveled that we don't have in the problem. We would know how far away they are and how long we'd have to catch up. Let me think for a sec. Actually, that way we could solve pretty quickly. Let me show you another method that may be a little bit easier to see. So what Charles said was this. The first train leaves three hours early and travels at 50 kilometers an hour, right? So he multiplied these two to get the distance of the gap. So the gap is 150 kilometers. So right now, here's train two, here's train one. Train one left a while ago, train two is still waiting, and as soon as train two leaves, there's 150 miles between them. How much faster was train two traveling than train one? 25, 25 kilometers an hour, and it needs to cover a gap of 150 kilometers. So if you take the 150 and divide it by the difference in the velocities, you get six hours, the time we take to cover the gap. So that's another approach, so Ben, uh, not Ben, Charles, that would work also, okay? But again, just please list givens, list what you know, show your work, show your formulas. So I would have said like, you know, T equals this, rate equals this, distance equals rate times time, distance is the gap, I'm covering the gap by using the change in velocities, okay? Another good approach to that. Good, good.
problems. Let's take a look at example six now. Take a look at example six. Kelly, can you read it for us, nice and loud? Thanks. Okay, so again, are we going to get a number as an answer here? Look at the problem. Are we actually going to get a number as an answer? No. Why not? We don't know the distance traveled because we don't know the what? Yeah, we don't know the time. It's W hours. Notice W is italicized to indicate it's going to be a variable solution. Okay? Now, we know distance rate formulas. If I'm running, at five miles an hour, and an hour goes by, I take five miles an hour, an hour goes by, I've moved five miles, right? I just multiply the two. Distance equals rate times time. I've got the rate for both runners. So I've got two runners. One's here and one's here. Actually, let's get two people up again. It'll be very obvious once you see it. Two different people. Well, come on up. Come on up, Mike. All right. So Will and Mike are going to start back to back. Okay? Now, we're both starting at their house. And we're told that we'll start with Mike. Mike's going to leave his house first, and an hour later, Will's going to leave. We'll, we'll make an hour a second instead, okay? So Mike starts. Mike's going to walk at a faster pace than Will. Not too fast, okay? So Mike's going to start, then Will starts. What do you notice is happening, Paul? What do you notice is happening about the distance between them? It's getting larger, right? And it's getting larger at the rate at which they're moving. So the distance he, that Will covers this way, Plus the difference might, distance might covers this way is the total gap between them. Agreed? So we really don't care about the direction right now. We care about the fact that they're spreading apart. Thanks, guys. So what should we do for a problem like this? How should we begin the problem? What approach should we take? How should we think about it? And I want to think about the thought process. Luca, start us off. The what of your brother, or the what of you? Yeah. The so, just since you're moving apart, the distance is going to be as scary, you're going to put each of them six of you. Okay, now, close. Extremely close. There's one mistake there. What's the mistake? He started an hour later, started an hour later right? Don't forget that. So let's, but the, pro the process is good so far. Nina, you want to go? Now let me explain where this comes from, because I see that a lot of you are picking up on it, by the way, already. But remember, this is really D1 plus D2 equals D total, right? Distance of object one or person one plus distance of person two equals the total distance. Well, distance equals rate times time. This is the rate one. This is time one. This is rate two. This is time two. This is the distance total traveled. Is that clear what we're doing? Did we get that? Now, it says, after W hours have gone by since you left home. Since you left home. So we need to change one more thing about this. Can anybody figure out what that one thing is we have to change? Nina was so close with her response. Charles. 5W. Not 5W. Not 5W, right? Yeah. Remember, you are the frame of reference. W hours since you have left. So this needs to be W. So if this is W, this has to be W minus 1 over here. Again, let's discuss this. It says, how far apart are you after W hours have gone by since you left home? You are the first jogger. So you have to take W hours. So we need to correct this and just make this W. But you're still an hour later. Your, your brother is still leaving an hour later. So your brother, his time is W minus 1. Okay, again, this needs to be a W. This needs to be 6 times the quantity W minus 1. There actually is a difference in the answer. There is a very big difference. You'll notice a positive negative difference actually in one of the, one of the terms of the final answer. So it's important to understand who the person is that's traveling for W hours. The person, you... 
you meaning you yourself, that's running at eight, clock, 8 miles an hour is traveling for W hours. So that cannot be W plus 1 there. That has to be W. So this person, your brother, is one less than you. So you write W minus 1. Okay? Now, it looks like this. 8W plus 6W minus 6, right? Distribute. Make sure you distribute, please. Which as a result is 14W minus 6. It's the algebraic representation of how far apart you are after W hours. Paul. From where to where, sure. Oh, just distribute. Distribute the six. It's parentheses, right? Distribute the both terms. So take that six, distribute it to the w minus one, right? It becomes six w minus six. So I'm showing you up here. Okay, distribute those two. Cool. Now let's talk about the significance of the answer. It's really kind of cool if you think about it. Where does the 14 come from? I'm only asking about the 14, so don't give me another answer. Where does the 14, Kelly, come from? It's both you and your brother's race combined. Exactly. Think about it for a second. If you're running at 8 miles an hour, your brother's running at 6 miles an hour, you guys are separating at 14 miles an hour. You see how that works? Again, if you're running apart, you kind of add the rates together. That's the 14. Now, times W, W is the amount of hours that have passed. So this is the distance you've traveled together if you were both traveling from the same starting time. But are you traveling at the same starting time? How much later is your brother leaving? An hour. An hour later. So we're losing how many miles from your brother? If he's traveling at a rate of six miles an hour, we're losing six miles minus six. Again, if you were both leaving at the same time, you could just add up the two rates, multiply the time it takes, and you get how far apart you are. But because your brother missed the first hour, and he wasn't there, he wasn't ready, he missed the first six miles he could have covered in that first hour, so it's minus six. Does the significance of the answer make sense? Okay, the minus six has to do with the missing first hour that your brother didn't run for. Okay? Nick, do you have a question? I saw you had a, a look on your face that just made me think you might have a question. Uh, no, I was just trying to see what you were about to say something. The distributive up top, this six up here, or this six down here? Um, the, um, okay, so distribute up the top to get the minus 6 from that part and then realizing that this is like you're missing the first hour of the job so you don't cover those 6 miles you could have covered in the beginning. Okay, and remember that your brother was running at 6 miles an hour and since he missed the first hour, he missed the first 6 miles. So if you traveled, say, for 14 hours at 14 miles an hour, your difference, your distance apart would be very large. It would be 196 miles but not those six miles, so only the 190 miles. Okay. okay? All right. Last problem. Last. This is one of those SAT problems. It's, it's rather easy, I think, but I prefer, I want to see let statements. I need to see let statements here. Please don't just write an equation. Okay, I want to see let statements. Uh, reader for us, Ben, nice and loud. It shouldn't say of, sorry. Typo. How many students of each gender does the club have? Yeah. Okay, so what is my let statement to start? What is my let statement, Kelly? A G equal girls. And number of girls. A G equal the number of, thank you. And it really bothers me when people abbreviate things and they don't make sense of it, so I'm glad you corrected yourself. But you don't just say let G equal girls. What do, you, what do you mean by girls? Number of, right? Quantity of. Because when we start looking at cost, it's different. So we mean the quantity of girls. Good, or number of girls. All right, so what would the number of boys be represented by then? If the number of girls is G, and we're told some relationship here, what do I have here, Mike? Uh, so we can start with two variables. We can start with two variables, that's fine. That's one way to solve these, right? But we haven't done things with two variables yet. So instead of saying B, what could you say B is in terms of G, Mike? Let's read the sentence. I'm underlining for you up there. Uh, for less than twice the number of girls. Good, so how do I write that? Uh, G times 2 minus 4. 
Very good. The number of girls minus four, but that's, uh, sorry, twice the number of girls minus four is written as four less than twice the number of girls. Whenever you see four less than, think you're going to subtract four to whatever you start with. Okay, so you're subtracting four from this beginning point, which is twice the number of girls. Okay, so again, you could start with B, that's fine as well, but just to make it easier. And we're told that there's 26 members. Kelly? So if you like, think about like 26 equals the number of girls plus the number of boys, you get 26 equals G plus 2 G minus 4. Very good. Okay, and I like the way Kelly explains that. You think about it as, you know, the number of boys and girls together is the total class. You just sum them up. Now, I put parentheses here. Clearly, you don't need them. You're going to end up combining like terms to give you 3G minus 4. Why did I put parentheses? It's Good. It's like its own quantity. So I'm always going to start that way. Because there could come a day or come a time where it might say the difference in group members between girls and boys is 4. Then it would be G minus this whole thing equals 4. Are you with me? If I said the difference between the girls and boys in the club, or if I said there are, you know, five more girls than there are boys, and you know something else, you could say girls minus the amount of boys equals five on the end. So if this were a minus sign in between right here, the parentheses is really important. So I'm putting it there as an overemphasis, just to make sure that you guys understand that parentheses are very important. Okay, especially when you're subtracting an entire quantity. We happen to be adding it, so it's okay in this case. We don't need it really. And then we just solve this the normal way. Okay, again, we know that we can add those two. Add the four over, divide, we get G equals? Anybody? 10. Okay, G equals 10. Are we done? Is that it? What else did it say? What else did it say? What else did it say, Nana? Yes, so, so we should answer what else? So uh, if G equals 10, then B equals 16. And you can do that quickly because there's a total of 26. You could either take the 10, plug it back in, 2 times 10 is 20, 20 minus 4 gives you the number of boys, or just say 10 plus what number gives you 26? The answer is clearly 16. Okay? All right. So what I'm going to do is give you guys some time.